Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Ian Williams from Pioneer Brands. He's a foraging system specialist who's been there in excess of 20 years. And Chris Glassy, who's been around Dairy NZ for longer than most of us realise. Sorry, most of us can remember Chris. <laughs> and in excess of 40 years. So we look forward to their joint presentation. I'm not exactly sure how they're going to run it, but they're going to present to us on improving dry matter yield per hectare for integrating cropping into grazing systems, opportunities and challenges. And to you, Chris. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So can we use annual grasses and crops in our farm systems as opposed to retaining perennial, perennial well, I can't even say that word, perenniality in our pastures. So our paper is in two parts. First of all, I'm going to give a little bit of a historical perspective of why, how this question has come about and what's already available and tell you a little bit about what's already available in the literature. Um, and Ian's going to follow with um, a look at some farmer case studies where this has been implied in practice. So in the early 2000s, um, there was concern that, so that we weren't getting sufficient productivity gains from pastures to meet the industry growth targets. And they, a new industry target was set of 45 tonnes of dry matter per hectare per year uh, using crops that were integrated with pasture renewal. And this was achieved at plot scale uh, by Alina Manet and John DeRuta from Plant and Food and using a uh, maize and forage oats uh, on a, uh, a cycle. And um, yeah, the, the proviso there was that no cow went near that paddock. It was just a, a, it was just a crop paddock. Um, at the same time, we've we could see that combinations of maize silage and winter forage in the Waikato were exceeding 30 tonnes of dry matter uh, regularly, um, and there's quite a bit of published information uh, supporting that. Uh, and there were other benefits of using crops, such as uh, bu uh, buffering seasonal feed deficits, managing surplus pasture growth, um, break crops for pasture with weeds and pests during pasture renovation. Murray Lane's work there. Um, it potentially could help avoid summer overgrazing and we could use crops to help manage nutrients around the farm. Some uh, work done by Paul Johnston at Plant and Food on that around about 10 years ago. And um, so what's happened uh, as a result of that uh, there's been varied success in integrating crops into grazing systems. There's various reports by farmers and researchers that are in the literature, uh, mainly uh, Waikato, uh, Taranaki, Waimati West, and Northland, NARF. Um, so, and what we found looking at the literature, there's often increased uh, success with increased milk solids production per hectare, and we, do, we can get some more dry matter yield across the farm per hectare uh, and some of this extra dry matter actually comes about through um, increased pasture production from um, pasture renewal in the cropping sequence. Uh, the thing we found also is that the increased production does not always increase profit so there can be a high marginal cost of cropping that exceeds the value of the extra production so in our case at Scott Farm we we got an extra 0.8 of a tonne of dry matter per hectare across the whole farm, uh, but it came at a cost of about 38 cents a kilogram of dry matter. So, uh, you know, you've got to be careful that you don't uh, push um, the costs along too high. Uh, cropping also adds a lot of complexity to decision making, financial and climatic. You don't actually always get rid of the climatic risk either because the crops are subject to it. Um, and there's also, oh, it requires new skills and practices that aren't commonly employed on dairy farms, so there's a whole new learning thing going to go in here, and there's often a lag phase between starting to get into a cropping cycle and when the potential benefits accumulate um, sufficiently and you start realising some profit from them. So I'm going to hand over to Ian now. 
Yeah, thanks, thanks, Chris. I mean, one of the things that uh, I think as scientists we learn is that farmers actually teach us. And um, so today I just want to, I've got four quick case studies that really cover how farmers have gone about implementing some of the principles that we've learned from science uh, into their systems and actually making them work. All four farms are highly profitable farms. Uh, all four, fa uh, two of them are in the Waikato, one of them is in, uh, down in the Manawatu, and the other is a sheep and beef property over in the Wairarapa. Um, just to summarise what Chris said, when you're looking at a, cr a cropping within a pasture-based system, people would do it for a number of reasons. Increased total dry matter, with a case study on that. Changing feed pattern, we've got a case study on that. Filling feed gaps, stabilising feed production, pasture renewal and filling nutrient gaps are all significant um, uh, reasons for the change. The first one I want to talk about, the first case study is, is Paul and Chris McKenzie out of Waharoa. 83 hectares effective. 380 cows doing big production per cow, big production per hectare. Harvesting, by the way, sorry, this is an area, your the, the, the pasture harvest is around about 14 tonne of dry matter. Um, so, you know, we've assumed a, at 80% utilisation, 17 and a half tonne growing. Their maize uh, crops, uh, at, so they have a, so 37, 40, you know, 40 something percent of their farm is in crop. They grow maize in summer and then have annual ryegrass in winter, yielding around about 29 tonne total. Um, just some numbers for them. The reason why they do this, by the way, is they also bring in a lot of feed, so it's to reduce their average cost of feed on farm. So their base farm, if you, if you assumed 83 hectares at 17 and a half tonne, they're growing about 1,400 kilograms, uh, 1,400 tonne of dry matter. With their pasture crop um, rotation, uh, they have lifted that between four to five tonne, to, point, to Chris's point, depending on the seasonality. So that may be lower one season and may be higher than another. Significant amount of more feed grown per hectare which is then used to average down the cost of feed. Second farm that I want to talk about is um, uh, Jared and Christine, I mean Justine uh, Whitfield's property down in Levin. So they're a 255 hectare farm, about 37% of that is in crop, that's maize and annual ryegrass, five cows to the hectare and uh, over, uh, uh, their wintering stock rate is five cows to the hectare, high production per cow, high production per hectare and harvesting around about 17 tonne of dry matter. Now, what, what Jared, is, and, and uh, so Jared had one of these aha moments, went to a David Becker, heard David Becker speak, heard about broad in feed and the impact that that has on um, uh, profit, had a very complicated system, so he decided that he was going to basically grow a whole lot of homegrown feed, grew, grew maize on farm, and basically simplified their system. So what they, and, and the other thing, it was, heard Corey Matthews speak and heard about the importance of um, uh, stocking rates in spring. So the farm grows a huge amount of feed in spring and summer. The crop is used to increase the pressure. So, the, so during spring and summer, their stocking rate goes up to seven cows per hectare, and they effectively transfer the surplus out of spring and summer and put it in, into autumn and winter and use grazing management through spring and summer in order to feed, maintain feed quality. And the cows are fed on a feed pad over winter. The, 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 the third case study is uh, Brendan and Rochelle O'Leary, once again, an owner-operated property just north of Hamilton. 380 cows, so four, four and a half cows per hectare. Pretty good production per cow, pretty good production per hectare. And not harvesting, by the way, sorry, this is an error in the slide here. They're growing around, they're har harvest, growing around about 17 ton now. They're harvesting around about 13 to 15 ton of dry matter. Now, I just want to show you this graph. So... Um, Brendan and Rochelle were one of the more profitable farms in the dairy uh, in, in the Waikato region. And they were pretty consistent in terms of their pasture harvest or their pasture growing until drought, black beetle, and, and, and summer heat started to hit. And you can see what happened to their um, pasture eaten figure. It just started to go into free fall. And Brendan said, hey, we need to do, because who is buying in more and more feed, we need to do something about this. And so what they did, and there's a, there is a gap in the data, there's a gap in the data, and the reason for the gap in the data was because he basically lost heart, uh, talk about mental health and all those sort of things, and then he basically started to record again. He introduced um, chicory and a little bit of maize laterally to actually just stabilize their summer production. And, and so the, the, he stabilized the summer production, which has stabilized the, annual over, uh, the overall annual production by using chicory and a little bit of maize in summer. The last uh, uh, case study is um, uh, uh, Andy and Natalia uh, McLaughlin, uh, just north of the Wairapa. 15,000, I mean, sorry, 1,500 effective um, farm. 
Yep, 15,000 stock units, so 70% sheep, 30% cattle, 140% lambing, lots of lambs, and now seven, uh, and, and a significant portion of those are finished. 20% of the lambs are now sold at weaning, 10% are sold at store, so now they, they, they went from, from selling about 80% of their lambs at store, 90, 90 hectares of crop has enabled them to finish 70% of their lambs on crop. And then they get higher lamb weights, they're able to put more pressure on their pasture through summer with their ewes, and therefore uh, they've been able to get um, an increase in toughening percentages. Okay. So these um, case studies that Ian outlined show that successful and profitable implementation is possible, but uh, we've got uh, widespread applications going to be limited by suitable soil types, the skills and needed and the complexity of the farm systems, uh, there's potential for high marginal costs, so there are often profitability issues around this. Uh, it's going to, there's still going to be some risks around um, environmental impact. Uh, you've still got a, a climate risk, and you've got the financial risk I just mentioned. And what we found when uh, searching out these case studies is that many farms don't have sufficient records, um, so they've we're, it's very hard to evaluate these case studies uh, in, a, in a comprehensive and meaningful way.